I'll, I'll come back to that, the education and the, and the spending issue in a second. Ted, I know you want to. Yeah, I'll have to just respond. <clears throat> what I love about Ralph is that he's got so many statistics that now I've got to come up with a, a whole range of them to, to counter. Uh, let me start with the first one. Sure. Ralph says that, that you know, this is going to lower taxes for 94%. But the, the one thing that he leaves out right off the bat is that he, his plan, his plan does not allow for the tax to sunset as it's legally supposed to, to 3.75. He immediately proposes to keep it at 5%. So right there we're talking about a tax, keeping the current high tax and not letting it sunset. On top of that, he wants to put the higher tax rates. Uh, we talked about the teachers, and I'm, I'm holding Ralph's plan right here, or a, a piece of Ralph's plan. Ralph taxes people making over 100,000 to 150,000 at 7.5%. That's a lot higher than the 3.75 that we legally expect in just one year. So I'm not sure how Ralph wants to defend that, but those taxes are higher. Somebody making 8.5% will be 150, uh, at 150,000 will pay 8.5%. His taxes go higher and higher. There are successful entrepreneurs who are not rich, who work really hard to make 150,000. And those are the people that we talk about would be punished under under that plan. The quick defense, let, let, the, the quick defense is there. Well, effective Ralph, Ralph, tax rate Ralph, taking into account our full proposal at that same level is four percent, and you ignore the effective tax rate and focus in it marginal because it's the only way you can make your case. Well, I think, I think, but the bottom line is, if you take the entire proposal and look at it from top to bottom, it would be a tax cut, and that's the data as run through the Illinois Department of Revenue so, dynamic so, modeling system. And one more step. Well, Ralph, we did Ralph, it to counter the then existing tax structure. If we wanted to do it and tax rates go down, we could come up with identical results with different rates under the current system. We weren't trying to do that. So, so okay, Ralph, go ahead believes, and Ralph believes that marginal tax rates don't matter, right? He, he, he thinks that people, you can tax them, it doesn't matter, people won't leave. Ralph's data seems to be the opposite of what everybody else sees. If you look at the IRS data and look at where people are moving, from which states people are moving from and to, you will see that Illinois is the 48th, 47th, it depends on which year, the, the state that loses the most people. Uh, a fact about California, California has lost a million and a half people, uh, in the, I think since uh, 2000. Texas has gained almost a million. They're a zero tax state, and California has the highest marginal tax rates. They have the, the most aggressive, progressive tax state. So the, the outmigration numbers matter. We have a lot of data on our website about that, and we'd be happy to share that. Um, one of the key points that, that uh, Ralph mentioned was a study of the 10 states that have, uh, sorry, the, the nine states that have no income tax and the nine states that have the highest taxes. And if you compare those two, you will get exactly the opposite of what Ralph has mentioned. And, and this work has been also uh, proved by many other people. If you look at population growth, the zero tax states have grown two and a half times faster than the high tax states. If you look at uh, economic growth, it's one and a half times. The statistics for, for states like Florida, like Texas, uh, North, South Dakota, there's a whole bunch of quite a few states that are zero tax and they're doing extremely well. North Carolina just came out uh, two weeks ago and said they're gonna give up their progressive tax because they need to become more competitive to attract more business. So they're moving to a flat tax. So I think the whole modernization angle is the exact opposite of what Ralph says. His modernization plan is let's raise taxes, let's get the rich, we'll bring those brackets down and get the middle class. The other side is saying let's not tax income, let's not tax hard work, let's not tax success, and let's move towards a zero income tax structure where we can become much more competitive. Okay, Ted, now you mentioned uh, a, a few minutes ago the magic word that I think we're gonna be hearing a lot of um, over the next uh, 16, 18 months as we head into the gubernatorial election season, and that is sunset. Because, as I mentioned earlier, on January 1st, 2015, most of, our, uh, most of the 2011 tax increase is supposed to sunset. We're going back down to a 3.75% flat tax rate, and as I mentioned, uh, that's gonna result in the state losing in the neighborhood of $7 billion a year. And I think most of the people in this room probably know that Illinois has a general revenue fund of about in the neighborhood of $36 billion, but much less of that is discretionary funding. So my question to you, and I'll start with Ted on this one is, I'm assuming you're an advocate of letting it sunset. 
Uh, and one of the Republican candidates for governor, Bruce Rauner, already has voiced his belief that he wants it to sunset as well. The other candidates have been, you know, we haven't gotten as many specifics out of them yet, other than um, Bill Daley on the Democratic side, who is in favor of, pro of a progressive system. But, but we have one Republican candidate who is solidly in favor of letting it sunset, losing out on that revenue. My question is, $7 billion is a huge chunk to take out of the discretionary revenue fund for Illinois. From 2009 until the current fiscal year, our education spending had been going down, down, down. As, as Ralph alluded to, we, we, kept it, we kept it about level this year. If you let this tax sunset, where or do you find that seven, six, seven, eight billion dollars in savings that we're going to have to find? Ted? Okay. The, again, let me go back to the 2011 tax hike. Governor Quinn and other leaders promised that by giving them $7 billion a year more, they would pay down the bills, they would, they would get the economy back on track, and that the pension crisis would be somewhat diminished. Two years later and $14 billion later, our pensions are still collapsing. Chicago pensions are crazily dangerous to, 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 to a Detroit-type scenario sooner than we think. And we still have the unpaid bills. It's not working. And what we need to do and what we proposed in our 2013 budget solutions and our 2014 budget solutions is to allow the tax to sunset. Because what we need to do is incentivize Springfield leadership to actually make the reforms that need to be made. Look, there's a stat that's used often, and we did a, a big report on this, on education spending. People love to say that education spending is down. The fact of the matter is education spending is way up, and it has gone up tremendously in the last years. The sad part is, is that the money's all going to pensions, teacher pensions, and teacher retiree health care. So the money that we're dedicating to, to education is still going to education, it's just not going to the classroom, it's going to the unreformed pensions, which are eating up more and more of the budget. So if you look at our problem, and Ben Van Meter, who's my colleague here, who's our budget and tax director, he did an analysis, and if spending, uh, if spending had grown, let me say it this way, we could track spending back from 1990 to today, and had it grown at the rate of population plus inflation, and compare that to the spending that we've actually had over those, um, over 20 years, spending has grown three times faster than population plus inflation. We spend way too much. So we look at, uh, Matt, to answer your question specifically, the first step is massive pension reform. There is no way to get Illinois out of this crisis without massive pension reform. Number two is Medicaid reform. We think that our Medicaid program has ballooned so much that the, the people that really deserve the care that, that, that Medicaid was reformed, uh, designed for, can't get access to care because we have a ballooning system that doesn't work. But just last year, there was the there was a you know 2.7 billion dollars in Medicaid reductions that, you know, that threw a lot of people out of out of health care. Well, the Aren't thing we is, we did so, Matt. We did cuts. We didn't do reforms to the system. Cuts to budgets don't do anything except for slow down the the, the growth for for a given period. You need to reform these systems so that we they get healthy and and grow at the right pace. Uh, so bottom line, we've, we've put out a proposal that cuts nearly $7 billion in spending, and it's the right way to get Illinois on the, the right track to real growth and real economic prosperity. So Ralph, it goes down to 3.75%. We're short billions of dollars out of our discretionary funding. What do you see for okay. Illinois under that right. scenario? Well, back to reality. So the only way you can say that spending in Illinois has increased over this sequence is, is if you include the repayment of the debt that we borrowed to subsidize services over the past 20 years. If you isolate expenditures on services alone, we are spending about 28% less today than in the year 2000 on the four core services of education, healthcare, social services, and public safety, where nine out of $10 of our service expenditures go. That's number one. Number two, as you pointed out, there are two parts of the general fund budget. Hard costs that we have to pay, this is our debt repayments, our local government distributive fund where we share some revenue with local governments, et cetera. And then there's the discretionary amount that we spend on services. That has been steadily declining and in fact has been cut 
in nominal dollars without adjusting for inflation by well over $4.5 billion since 2007. That's on those four core services of education, health, social services, and public safety. If, in fact, this $7 billion disappears, that $7 billion in cuts has to come from education, health, social services, and public safety. We're only spending about $24 billion on those right now. As you pointed out, we have a deficit. It's about $8 billion. So it's about a third of our general fund expenditures on services now. We'll go up to over half. We'll go to two-thirds of our budget would be deficit spending or dramatic cuts. That's an untenable situation brought about by poor tax policy that didn't comport with a modern economy and didn't tax people fairly, encouraged us to borrow a ton of money against the pensions, and now we're paying that borrowing back. So what Ted is categorizing as a pension payment is a debt repayment with a really silly amortization schedule that increases by well over a billion dollars a year. In fact, if our only problems with the pension systems were those inherent to the systems themselves, raises, benefit increases, changes in assumptions, all those things, our systems would be almost 80% funded today. 80% is healthy, according to the Congressional Budget Office. There'd be no crisis, and we could certainly fix it in the 30-year cycle. The reason we have this huge unfunded liability is all that borrowing from years, and in particular, the repayment schedule, which was ridiculously backloaded, creating the fiscal crunch we have now. So it's dealing with that debt and reamortizing that debt that solves that problem. We can't afford to lose the revenue. So if you're going to have a change in tax policy because you have this sort of Damocles hanging over your head and this drop dead date and the sunset. Why not go to a reform that will raise more revenue on the one hand that the state does need to support its current level of services and number two, taxes people fairer? I think that that's the question confronting Illinois. And the answer is very clear. You go to a progressive rate structure. And you don't have to just trust me for that opinion. Uh, I'm going to quote directly from the Wealth of Nations and from Adam Smith right now, OK? Wow. Uh, because he talked about <laughs> fairness in tax policy. And he directly cited Sir Henry Holm, Lord Kames, for the provision that this is how taxes would a goal of taxation should be to remedy inequality of riches as much as possible by relieving the poor and burdening the rich. That's not Karl Marx. It's not Groucho Marx. <laughs> it's Adam Smith. And it's straight out of the wealth of nations. Because he understood, and in the wealth of nations he theorized, that in a capitalist economy, economic growth would always disproportionately go to top income classes over the bottom and middle. And as I laid out for you, the data have very much proven that Adam Smith's theory has worked the way he thought. The only way to respond to that actual economic trend and to tax people in a manner that accords with their ability to pay is to have a rate structure that increases over marginal stretches of income as income grows over time and should be very much focused at the top 90 uh, the top 10 percent and to be very clear even if you implemented the one sort of approach CTBA modeled out and it's not the only approach we would support and there's a number of other ways to do it but even if you implemented our proposal as it is that effective tax rate at the very top would increase by a little tiny amount anywhere from 1.5 to 2 percent nowhere near enough to stimulate any sort of economic behavior. And like I said, I would refer you to the independent studies that have been peer reviewed, one done by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, the other by the Institute of Tax and Economic Policy, that basically disprove that there is any relationship between your tax policy and movement. Why people move? The number one thing, housing costs. Florida has no income tax. Florida had a bunch of people moving into that state into the 90s because their housing market and housing costs were very low. When the housing market responded and started going up, people started leaving Florida. There was no change in tax policy. 
there is a change in housing costs. Okay. You know, so Ralph, Ralph, what, we, could... what we really need is a data-based approach to this stuff that looks at these long-term trends that hasn't been run through some funky proprietary model that is based on simple math and, and looks at the, what's really happening in America generally and in Illinois specifically.